Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to introduce Kate Hayes. She's a uh, doctoral candidate in integrative systems, integrative and systems biology, University of Colorado. Uh, I know Kate's been going to school for quite some time. I don't know exactly. <laughs> Uh, until we attended, uh, a lot of us attended a Feast for Funds dinner, uh, Nick and Angela's home and her parents, uh, back last February, and we were sitting around after dinner after a delicious uh, Greek meal was prepared by Nick and Angela, and uh, Kate started talking about what she was studying, and we all were just mind blown as to what she had to say about her, uh, about her schooling. And uh, so I th thought, well, you need to have a larger audience than just us sitting around the dining room table. <laughs> so I uh, invited her to come for a part of the day. And so uh, without a uh, further introduction, I'd like to uh, introduce Kate and come forward. So. <laughs> good 
nor bad, they are just change. And it really wasn't until I was putting together this talk that I realized how apt of a scientific field disturbance ecology really is for a Unitarian Universalist, <laughs> right? This is not good nor bad, it is just difference. And it is our sort of choice to determine how we react to that difference. Um, and so disturbances can be really positive forces, right? A forest fire can rejuvenate a forest, it can restore forest health, and in fact, most forests grow actually faster after a disturbance, which means that they capture more carbon out of the air. Uh, but certainly disturbances can be negative things as well, right? We're starting to see this increase in coverage of disturbances in the cultural conscience, right? We have these stories and these pictures emerging from places like Australia right now, of the forest fires in Australia, uh, we've had coverage from California and from the Amazon this summer, and that coverage is really deeply steeped in trauma, right? It's the trauma of people losing their homes or their lives to a force that is, from their perception, completely out of their control. And so, unfortunately, we might expect to see an increase in this type of coverage, an increase in these type of stories, because we're going to expect to see an increase in disturbances with climate change. Not all disturbances, right? We don't really think we're going to see more landslides, change. Um, but we do know that there's a scientific link uh, to an increase in the frequency and magnitude of forest fires, a frequency and magnitude of hurricanes and tropical storms, and an increase in the frequency and magnitude of extreme weather events. Things like cold snaps, things like heat waves, and things like drought. And so moving forward, there's a specific need to really understand how disturbances are linked to climate change and how we respond to them. And furthermore, I would argue that disturbances are really, for most of us, going to be the physical manifestation of climate change, right? A forest fire that threatens your house or a cold snap that freezes your pipes is going to be a much more tangible risk to your safety than something like hitting that 400 parts per million in the atmosphere, right? It is going to be the way that you interact with climate change on a personal level. So there's this need then to understand what that looks like, how communities and individuals can engage with that and respond to that. And so I'm going to present some work today, and I'm going to talk specifically about the Arctic, but more specifically I'm going to talk about Alaska. So I've worked in Alaska for the last two years, studying disturbances and climate change, uh, and I'm going to make the argument here today that Alaska is a really interesting region with which we can learn quite a lot about disturbances and climate change. Um, this is really a place that we can gain a lot of insight as a community, even as a room of people in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I'm certainly not the first person to say this. There's this increase in coverage of the Arctic and coverage of climate, uh, climate change in places like Alaska, uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. And so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to start with what does climate change look like in Alaska? What's actually changing? What's happening? why it matters to a room of Unitarian Universalists in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which hopefully should not be that part of an argument. Um, and then I'm hoping that this third bit can be a bit more interactive. What can we do about it? What can we learn from the communities in Alaska dealing with climate change right now? And what can we bring back home to us here? So, first and foremost, what does climate change look like in Alaska? Well, the reason why I'm talking about this is climate change is objectively happening faster in Alaska. Alaska is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the United States. In fact, many scientists think it's actually 2.5 times faster. And so you have this really dramatic increase in temperature, right? You have areas of the state that are almost six degrees warmer than they were in the 70s, which is crazy. Um, and this warming is happening across seasons. So here's a graph. Um, this is the number of days in Alaska with temperatures lower than 30 below, right? Which is objectively absurd, even in Wisconsin. Uh, but in the 40s, that was somewhere around, they had on average about 42 days a year under 30 degrees. That has dropped dramatically uh, to go kind of about 30 in 2019. Uh, and so the climate is change changing rapidly in the winters, which means big changes for things like snow and permafrost, which we'll get into in a moment. It's also changing rapidly in the summer. Um, this, I think, technically animates, but I don't think it's gonna go. Um, but the key thing to point out here is that there were areas in Alaska this summer that reached 110 degrees. Ooh. Areas above the Arctic Circle that reached above 100 degrees, yeah. right? Which is essentially unheard of for this region. So there's a lot of physical changes <laughs> happening as a result of this warming, and I'll show you a few of them. This should probably not be that much of a surprise, the glaciers are melting, right? Glaciers are melting all over Alaska. This is an area in the eastern part of the Alaskan mountain range 
This glacier has been monitored for about 50 years, and you can see it's retreated almost all the way up the valley in that time period. So this is just one picture of one glacier. Over 90% of the glaciers in Alaska are currently retreating. And that means that billions of tons of, of glacial ice is melting. Um, here's another way to visualize that. You can see that there's this increase in the winters, right, as the glaciers start to grow back a little bit, but that really that summer temperature um, means that they ultimately end up retreating. And so this is billions of tons of ice, and the reason why this matters for us here is not only is this understandably quite tragic, but if all of the ice, all of the glacial ice in Alaska melts, the sea level will rise <coughs> by an inch and a half, right? And so if you think about the amount of sea level lying communities that we have, that's a dramatic number. So not only is the glacial ice melting, but the sea ice is as well. So this is the ice cap. Um, you can see that this is, this is a little small, I apologize. This is the average concentration in September of 1988. That's the average in September of 2008. So that ice is melting back. Um, here's another way to visualize it. This is the usual extent, and then this is the summer minimum of this year, right? And so here's the slide that gets me the most angry. Um, there are cruise ships going through the Northwest Passage. The first cruise ship passed through the Northwest Passage in 2016, and now you're seeing this emergence of an entire luxury industry crossing through that area because the ice is melting. That just makes me want to go to the table. Um, and so not only are, are there this open, is this changing tourism in Alaska, it's also changing things like trade, things like sustenance, right? Uh, this ice melt is really dramatically impacting the food web in these marine systems, which really puts tribes in a place where they can't feed themselves anymore. Um, so the glacial ice is melting, and then finally, permafrost is melting. And so permafrost, the technical definition is that permafrost are soils that remain frozen for two consecutive years, um, at least two consecutive years. And Alaska is dominated by permafrost, uh, it's, and there's a couple of different types. There's continuous, uh, which means that all of this area, all of the ground is frozen in that region. Uh, most of Alaska is dominated by discontinuous permafrost, so areas where there's permafrost in some places, maybe shady areas, areas that stay a little colder year-round, um, and then some isolated down south. And the problem here is that permafrost is really just frozen peat. It's organic matter, it's litter and leaves that have been deposited in the last ice age. These are carbon stores that have been frozen for thousands of years. And so when this permafrost starts to melt, as you can see in this picture, that matter, that carbon is allowed to start to decompose, which releases carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere in, in, in really striking amounts. So that line of discontinuous permafrost, we think it's retreated 80 miles north in the last 50 years. Right, and the problem here is that we don't actually really know because it's really hard to study. You can't pick up frozen ground from satellites or our usual technology. And you certainly, at least we haven't yet, sent out fleets of people to just go test all of these spots in, this, in these remote areas. So it could actually be faster. Um, and this is not just an Alaska problem, this is an Arctic problem. This is all of the permafrost, right? You see have these massive stores in Russia and Siberia. Um, and when that starts to go, that is really going to dramatically affect the rest of our environments. Um, because if for all of the carbon that humans have released through their emissions between 1850 and the present, think about that, all of the fossil fuels that we have burned in that time period, there is five times the amount of that carbon in permafrost right now. Five times. Um, so, I don't really have to nail that home, uh, but this is a, an Alaska member of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Whatever happens in the rest of the world will be determined by what happens in the Arctic and what happens in Alaska. Right, the warming that occurs there is going to affect the rest of us, undoubtedly so. So that's cheery, so we'll keep going. Um, so I'm gonna get into the last bit, the last physical change that's happening in Alaska, and this is actually my favorite, because this is the, the project I get to work on. I work on forest fires in Alaska. And so you can probably already imagine that since I've told you about warming temperatures and changing climate, we're seeing an increase in forest fires in Alaska across the entire state. And so I, I, I talk about this a lot uh, because it's what I do, and so I often get this question, like, well, there are forest fires in Alaska? And the answer is that not only yes, but they are massive, right? These are thousands of acres that burn un uninterrupted because they never really threaten a city 
in the way that they do in, in places like California or Oregon. And Alaska is, from an ecological standpoint, classified as fire prone, but it's prone to fires over much longer intervals than we're currently seeing. These are forests that used to burn every 100 or 300 years, really infrequent fires. And within the last several decades, we're starting to see fires every 10 or 15 years, right? So we're starting to, starting to see more and more fire. I just really like this picture. This structure on the left, can anyone guess what that is? Yeah. 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 Right? Um, they also, it, this is an aside, they just call it the pipeline up there. Yeah. That's the one. That's, yeah. So, you know, that's ironic. Um, so moving on, here's a way to picture that, right? The total acres burned every year is increasing. And you'll see it's not a steady increase, but you do have these massive individual fire years. Um, 2019 was, was sort of one of them, but really the, the key thing to point out here is 2004. 6.2 million acres burned in Alaska in 2004. Right? I don't even have a, a, a way to conceptualize how big of an area that is, really. Um, another way to picture it, this is a, a, a map of reburning. So everything in blue has burned once. You can see it's most of the state. It's bounded by, this is the Brooks Mountain Range up in the north, and this is the Alaska Mountain Range down in the south. Uh, and most of that area has burned in the last 80 years. And you have these areas, these little patches that are starting to burn um, multiple times within the time period, which again is so far outside historic norms, so far outside the range of historic variability um, that it's, it's something completely new. And the problem here is that, um, and this is where I get into my own research, Alaska is dominated by essentially one species, one tree species. This is black spruce. It grows in these shrubby little stands, uh, tiny little things. Uh, they grow really small, even though some of these trees might be 200 years old. Um, and this species has been dominant and stable in this system for about 6,000 years. The problem is, is that black spruce takes 50 years to grow back after fire. So you can do the math, doesn't look right, uh, what we're starting to see is this would maybe happen in the past. So you'd have a fire, right? That fire would rejuvenate the forest. You'd have all of this growth. And then eventually, after 50 years, the black spruce is dominant again, and things sort of go their merry way. What's happening instead is you have this reburning. You have a fire, and then another fire within short interval. And what's happening is that different species are growing back. The black spruce can't grow back. And what you have instead are species like willow and aspen and birch, which are much more like what we would see here in Wisconsin than what we would ever see in Alaska. So I'll, I'll talk more about what that means. Um, we've set up 50 observational plots in different forests in Alaska, and we've gone out to each and every one of them and measured the trees that are growing back in order to see what this change really looks like. And I'll tell you why this matters right up front, is that these types of forests, forests dominated by species that we would see more often here in Wisconsin, don't insulate permafrost as well. They don't cover the ground as well. And so you have more of this carbon loss when these trees start to change. So there's this, there's this idea that with an increase in fire, uh, that these, these environments will change over and, and will actually accelerate the warming we're already seeing. I know, I'm really fun at parties. <laughs> <laughs> really just great company. I love good dinner parties. Um, so I'll show you some pictures. So this is a, a, a one of our plots, one of our scientific study areas up in Alaska. These are my two field hands, actually, in the in the orange. This is an area that has not been burned recently, right? You can tell it's pretty it's pretty obvious. It's very dense. These are thick forests, lots of black spruce. This is one of our sites that has burned one time, right? And this is pretty common. You can see the black spruce that are left are these dead standing ones that have been burnt, and that you have all of this regeneration happening. You have all these trees growing back. You have some spruce and some other things and some really lovely wildflowers and it's, it's kind of a nice sight. Here's one of our sites, ooh, one of our sites that has burned twice. So you can see much less spruce, right? Um, the only stuff that's left are these little burnt guys and that the plants are growing back. For those of you who are maybe avid um, ecologists, these are plants like we would see in Wisconsin. Right? The ground's a lot less covered, it's a lot more open, um, which means more sunlight, which means more permafrost loss. Um, and then here's the kicker. Here's one of our sites that's burned three times. This would have looked like the first picture, um, and yet there's no spruce growing back. The species that are here actually are more of a savanna or a grassland style species. The ground is completely open, and, in, and many times there's no soil left on the top of the surface. 
It's all been burnt off. Um, so the spruce is not growing back and the insulation underneath is changing. Here's all four pictures just for emphasis. When I showed this presentation or these pictures at a, a talk I was giving in Colorado, uh, a girl stood up at the very end and said, that looks like my backyard. Wow. Right, this is not normal for Alaska by any means. I'll give you some, uh, because I'm a scientist and I like graphs, here's a graph of that same trend. Um, <laughs> any excuse, right? So here's spruce. You can see it crashes after three fires. And here are these, what are called deciduous species that are starting to become dominant. Birch, again, is something that we would see maybe in northern Wisconsin, but even that might be too far north for birch here. So this is a really dramatic transition that's taking place in these forests. Um, and with that, we're seeing less and less permafrost. In fact, uh, the data for this is, is so new, it's, I haven't even really looked at it yet. But when we went out this summer, we didn't find any permafrost in those sites that have burned three times. Not a bit. <laughs> So the carbon is out of the ground. And so now you're thinking, where is this going? If this is the rest of my entire Sunday, what do I do with myself? Um, I don't have a clear answer, in part because scientists are, are trained to do science. They are not often trained to offer solutions. Um, but I, I will give you some of my own personal insights from working on this project. Um, I'm just going to put up this picture while I talk because it's pretty. But I was really fortunate enough to be asked to go to the Alaska Fall Fire Review this this fall, yeah, fall. Um, and it is a meeting of all of the people who fight fire in Alaska. It is firefighters, fire managers, people who manage things like the national parks, um, and all of the fire scientists that, that coalesce there as well. Um, and it was a really interesting weekend. It started off talking about logistics, right? All of the miles of hose that they use to fight fires up there, the, the jet loads of people that they bring up from the lower 48, as they call it, uh, to fight fires up here. Uh, but it ended on a really interesting note. This was a room of hundreds of people in Carhartt and big boots, people who look maybe not like climate change scientists, and all of them were supremely concerned with these trends. Right? The agencies that study fire up here, the agencies that study climate up here, have held climate change as a priority since 2003. Mm -hmm. They've been funding climate change projects since 2003. They are way ahead of the curve up there, because it, the climate change in Alaska is affecting every aspect of their lives. Right? Uh, and so I had the fortunate, I had a, a, the really good fortune of meeting the, the coordinator of the fire science group up there. And she's this lovely woman, and she told me that Alaska is severely under resourced, right? They don't have the same sort of scientific technologies that we have down here, they don't have the same observational capacities. They have three weather service stations, where the US has 38 or something like that, um, even though they are thousands of miles larger. And so they've been really, they've really had to be self-sufficient. This woman told me, I just have to go out and collect that data if I want it. I just have to go do it myself. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that in the last two decades, not only have they been specifically concerned with climate change for that entire time period, but they've had to coordinate with each other. They've been working with other communities to really find the resources they need to deal with this problem in their community. Uh, and so there's a lot of, of camaraderie and coming together you see in this group. Um, which I think is a really excellent lesson, right? That we are at some level going to have to rely on each other to deal with this problem. Uh, and then the final note I'll end on is that I am not a policymaker, but what I do know is that the organization that studies forest fires in the US, it's called the Joint Fire Science Program. It is a coordination of all the different agencies that deal with fire. It's things like the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, Fish and Wildlife, that sort of thing. They were founded 10 years ago and they fund climate change science, especially climate change science around fire. Uh, and it, for most of the, the 10 years that they've been around, they've had an annual budget of $13 million. In 2017, our Republican administration proposed that they get a budget of $0. <laughs> yep. And thankfully, they had enough advocates in places like Congress that that number has been bumped up to six. Six million, but all of that money has to go to fighting these fires and funding this science and figuring out exactly how much change we can deal with. And they are so severely under budgeted that we have a lot of trouble even funding the fire suppression efforts that are happening up here, <laughs> right? And so if I can leave you with one thing, it is please vote. <laughs> please make all your friends vote. Uh, and I will add, um, it is only really in talking about this stuff that we are going to start to, to uh, address these problems. Uh, and so
So please, please plagiarize anything I said up here today, any of the facts, right? And I will mention um, all of my figures, all of those graphs come from a really excellent printed report that the, the state of Alaska has put out called Alaska's Changing Environment. It is a four page document that really uh, brings all the science down to a really accessible level and it is completely free and online. So there are really good resources with which to share this science and write and start to talk about this problem. So I hopefully have turned things around a little bit. Um, but I will stop here and I'd love to have, I'd love to first take on any questions that people might have, but I'd also love to talk about if people have suggestions or thoughts. Yes. The question was about uh, the increase. If I, if I, uh, hopefully I'll get this correct. The increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? How does that affect not only human life but life on Earth? That's been a big focus, actually, especially because this increase in carbon dioxide is actually increasing tree growth in a lot of areas, right? Tree lines at high elevations are actually growing better than they have because now suddenly they have more carbon dioxide. Uh, unfortunately, we don't think an increase in carbon dioxide is going to really help humans at all. In fact, I don't know the science in this super well, but there's, there's theories that it will actually reduce our brain capacity, which is great. Um, but that's as much as I know, but I know there's, there is a lot of work being done. Do you have a, a two-minute elevator speech for people who don't believe that they think it's a hoax, that they think it's caused by the sun, that's the general and downs all the time. How would you convince somebody? <laughs> Until I can get around fast enough with this, you need to repeat the question. Sounds good. Okay, the question was, what's your two-minute elevator speech for someone who doesn't believe in climate change or thinks that the Earth is always been changing? Let's see. Okay. Um, well, if I can <laughs> refrain myself from flipping a table in that conversation, what I usually lead with is this idea um, that the Earth has always been changing, right? That's true, we know that. We know that across the Earth's million year history that the climate on Earth has always been changing. The problem right now is that it is changing faster than ever before. It is happening faster than we've ever seen, right? You have these big swings in climates, but they take thousands of years and we're, we're accomplishing that in just a couple of hundred, right? And that's not even getting into the fact that we are from a, an Earth climate standpoint, really projected to start entering an ice age soon, and we've completely reversed that trend, right? Um, so, and, and that's, to back up, I usually like to try to acknowledge when people have aspects of the science correct. And so I'll back up, there's a bar that we go to in Alaska every summer. It is the only bar, right? It is not, actually, it's the bar, the grocery store, the place where you take a shower, uh, the place where you get gas, the place where you buy beer. Right, it's a small, tiny place. And they always have the weather channel on. And there's always one guy, it's always the same guy, he's sitting at the end of the bar, he's watching his weather channel, drinking his beer, and they put on a story about sea level rise, or they put on a story about flooding. And I've watched him do this kind of once a week all summer, and he, he'll, he'll sort of lean back, and he goes, you know, sea levels have always risen. What? Mm. <laughs> right, or places have always flooded or the, the Earth has always changed. Or he'll say something about, well, you know, when we were in the ice ages, ice was melting and freezing all the time. And so what I like to do in those conversations, and I will admit I have not challenged a rural Alaskan in a bar in Alaska um, <laughs> as much as I would like to, maybe not the time or the place, maybe, not, maybe it's better to pick some battles, but I like to acknowledge, well, yeah, the Earth has always been changing. We know that, that, that science is correct. But why is it changing as fast as it is right now? Right? So I think what can be really effective in those conversations is to acknowledge whatever they do have and go from there. Are there any interdisciplinary studies of the effects of this climate change? For instance, 
uh, entrepreneurs who want to uh, grow things where they hadn't grown before, the shipping via the Northwest Passage, many of these things for quick profits, but has there been, have there been any interdisciplinary studies looking toward the future related to this? There's been a ton. I'll mention off the top of my head what comes to mind is um, we're seeing all sorts of shifts in trade, right? So now Oregon can grow wine better than California, right? Regions of growth are shifting northwards. Um, we're starting to see that happen in Europe as well. And so entire production lines that are really region associated, things like wine, things like coffee, are shifting north. Um, so yeah, so that's been looked at quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure how far forward a lot of those studies look, especially with things like the Northwest <coughs> Passage, right? That, that cruise ship from 2016 was sort of reviled on the internet, rightfully so, and the news came out about that. Um, and hopefully we'll reach a point where the, the carbon it takes to send a cruise ship up there is no longer worth it, but we'll see. Yeah. With your sense about the rate at which the permafrost is melting, um, can you give us some idea from your perspective um, about the potential or greater potential for uh, these so-called tipping points? Uh, maybe how permafrost might contribute to other things. Are you kind of up on that tipping point idea? A little bit. My hesitation in answering is sort of that scientists, scientists get this training not to say, well, well this is definitely going to happen, right? Because then it doesn't happen and we get in trouble. Um, I would say the melt that's happening right now is happening faster than we expected. It's happening faster than the models had predicted. And furthermore, um, I didn't mention this in the talk, but something that has really been sitting with me lately is I found out that um, when scientists are making models and simulations of what they expect to happen in the future, they usually rely on a few climatic predictions, right? How warm is it going to get? And then they go from there and they predict how much permafrost will melt or how many more forest areas we'll see. Uh, and so we usually, as, a, as the public, we usually talk about this two degrees of additional warming. You might have heard that number, right? If we get two degrees warmer on average as a planet, we are gonna be in some trouble. Climate scientists are no longer using that as a model. They're using four, four and a half, 3.8, because their models are simply not predicting what they're, what they're hoping to if they use the two, two degree estimate. So at least within the scientific field of climate change, there's, there's been this paradigm shift where, where we're not even using the, the worst case scenario scenarios anymore. Which is fun. <laughs> uh, back here. Uh, I was wanting more documentation uh, of your slideshow and the data and, and so on. You mentioned a four page report. Yes. Can you say more about where that is, how yes. to access it online? Yeah, so all of these graphs that I've shown, uh, they all come from this specific data source. It's a publication put out by the Alaska Interagency Coordination Center. Um, I'm really, if there's a way for us to do it within the, the forum system, I'm more than willing to make my slides public and then attach that document as well if people are interested. I guess people can uh, order <laughs> yeah, you want to talk to Nick Hayes in the back? Paul Hayes allows it. Yes. Two points. One is. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Thank you. It bothers me a great deal that we only talk about the number of people in homes, the structures that are damaged or destroyed permanently. We don't talk about the animals and the ecosystems. And I think that's an enormous problem. I know it's a very big issue because it's not just animals, but we, and we're also not coming up with like, we should be building habitat, and I mean serious habitat for all kinds of animals and species. The second one is a, qu a scientific question. So there's so much disturbance in the atmosphere, you know, the hurricanes, the rains for the floods, the fires, the smoke, of course, also soot. Um, is there any kind of um, diminution of the problem with the carbon being such a problem and, and um, the, you know, more sun radiating because there's more cover in the atmosphere? 
Yeah, you nailed it. So with the smoke that we're seeing in the atmosphere here, I'll put up this picture. I don't have a graph of this, unfortunately, but you can expect that that has led to huge increases in the amount of smoke cover in places like Alaska, or you know, we see this out west a lot. You're right, this reflects sunlight differently, right? And so actually what's happening is that it's, it's like darkening the windows of your greenhouse. It makes things heat up faster, right? So all of this particulate matter in the atmosphere um, actually does specifically, there is a proven link to additional warming with all of this smoke, right? You do see more, often more rain, essentially because there's more uh, particles for water to latch onto that to then drop into rain. Um, but whether that is enough to, to negate the effect of warming, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, I have family in California, and I regularly hear the stories how climate change is affecting them, whether it's running around Oakland looking for ice because there's going to be a mandatory power outage. Uh, my, my nephew was evacuated from his city, and I got a photo on my phone of him sleeping in the back of his car with his dog. Um, my, my daughter's in California. She talks about walking the sidewalks of her house in ankle deep water because mom has been raining so many days. <clears throat> I read something in the um, Washington Post that member, uh, um, city dwellers in Copenhagen, they're all city dwellers, realized for them to cut their climate emissions to a safe, if there's such a word, level, that 75%, 75% of their trips have to be made by public transportation, walking, or buses. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, then I don't have one. Um, <laughs> what about here in Milwaukee? It's um, good for me to try to explain to people, you know, this rain we've been having all summer and fall and winter, or this warmer temperature. This isn't just a normal pulse of nature is affected by this. What can we say to our friends right here in Milwaukee? So we're in a really weirdly fortunate position here in the Midwest, right? We aren't seeing those floods, we aren't seeing those forest fires. And so a lot of the, the uh, threats of climate change that you're starting to see emerge in other places of the world, places like the Gulf Coast, right, with hurricanes, places like California, are things that we can kind of avoid dealing with for a little while because we aren't physically uh, faced with it every day. Uh, and I, so I do think that ultimately the best thing we can do is share more stories about the friends and family we have in California, right? the people we know who are actually affected by this, who maybe live in other places of the world that are seeing these changes more, more drastically. Um, we will see it here as well, right? The lake is changing in new ways. The, the storms in the summers have shifted um, by months in some places. Um, and so I do think talking about it from a local sense is really important. Um, some people, this is uh, something I was thinking about mentioning, but I didn't. People have sometimes called Alaska ground zero for climate change. I really fundamentally disagree with that. I think ground zero just really depends on where your ground is. Uh, and so I think while it is helpful to talk about uh, these people who are maybe being impacted more specifically, I do think that talking about the changes that we're seeing in our own backyards right now is still really important um, to, to getting people to be, to be invested in this. And I will mention, I know that this is ending on sort of a doom and a gloom on a Sunday morning. Um, hopefully one of the takeaways can be that there are a lot of people working on this, right? There are thousands of people who are deeply committed to trying to find solutions to these problems, uh, who are trying to track these changes as they're happening in our environments, um, and really making sure that they have the funding and the resources to do so, and making sure that we're, we're voting um, so that they can do that is really important. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> I just wanted to know if you had actually spoken earlier this morning regarding palm oil and Indonesia, because I know that they're actually cutting down many of the old growth forests there. 
And I don't know if people are aware of how much palm oil is used in products. Um, if you see a label that says palm oil, um, I would recommend that you don't buy that product simply because of the fact that they're cutting down all the old growth forests and creating a real problem. And they've created a lot of fires in Indonesia. Um, and I don't know if you spoke to that, but I would like it if you could. I can speak to it a little bit. My project is on the Arctic, so that's where I work. Uh, that's my expertise. Um, but you are right, There are we're seeing this increase in fires also in places like Indonesia. Um, and really, I think, not only is maybe the takeaway that things like products like palm oil are a problem, but products that are not made locally, right? Um, if you are consuming something that is made on the other side of the world, then you're not ever really going to have to deal with the, the impact that that product has to that community, right? It's, or I mean, we're seeing this here too. So many of our farms are owned or operated by large corporations that are foreign interests who don't really have that much investment in what happens to our local environments, right? And so the more we can do to consume local products, the more we can do to support uh, local production, uh, I think the better shape we're all going to be in. Excuse me, Dave, I just have to make a quick announcement. Those of you who are going to second service, uh, this is the end of the second service. Uh, for next Sunday, we're having another one. <coughs> Uh, okay, for next for next Sunday, our speaker will be one of our own again, uh, Barbara Lee, and she's going to be speaking on humor, hope, and healing from a patient's point of view. So please come next Sunday if you can. And Kate can stick around for she said for a few minutes uh, to. Act. Entertain some more questions. I don't know if you know, but um, there is a bill. There is a bill being proposed uh, in the U.S. House. I don't remember the name of it, but it has to do with um, car carbon neutral policies. It's a very extensive. And what happens is as you reduce your carbon use, especially by using alternative forms of energy, excuse me, um, you, you get a rebate. And so whatever amount you're able to reduce, you, you benefit by. And it also puts caps on industries, the fossil fuel industry in particular, and they see a pathway very quickly that they're going to reduce the uh, carbon producing products in those, those industries. They're not going to be selling coal, developing coal any further. That would be one way people could really make a difference. It impacts the whole country in a very dramatic way. And if you would call your representative and ask them if they would co-sponsor the bill, it really will make a difference, a big difference. I've got one, but he, do you have one? Oh, well, I was, I was going to say, well, I was going to thank Kate first. That was really great. Um, I appreciate it. Sorry. I, I think I have a booming voice. <laughs> Oh, I understand. All right, well, so thank you, Kate. That was really wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to bring this back, and you, a bunch of people mentioned it, and you also, that I think it's important sometimes we get stuck on what can we do on this individual level. But I think some of the, you know, the, the strategy that the Republicans have put on the ground a lot of times is decentralized everything to the point where we feel responsible to do something on the individual level. But this is a bigger problem that we can, you know, handle by not eating almonds. So I think it's, it's really important to, to just make it, make, make a demand that this is addressed, right? This is not just my problem. It's my problem, and if you don't care about it, that's my problem too. So demanding that our government has an approach to this is, I mean, these are what uh, in economics are called externalities. It's something that you cannot leave to the individual person because it's not profitable enough for one person to change their behavior. But for the whole community, it's 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 um, imperative. So I so strongly agree. <laughs> right, this is not an individual level problem. This is an industrial level problem, and it is going to require an industrial level solution. Right, I, I had a really hard time with the plastic straw debate. If people remember that, it, most of the time, because when when companies like Starbucks got rid of their plastic straws, 
they reduced, they replaced it with a lid made of more plastic, <laughs> right? So it's not a solution, right? It, it's, um, I, I do think that there is a, in, in a world where we maybe don't have as much control over the situation as we would like, I, I, I don't want to discourage people who, who find value in making those replacements and, and reducing their own single use plastic use, right? Like if, if, if that's what you have to do to stay sane in this, I think that makes sense, but I completely agree this is not really going to be addressed until we address it at the right scale. Um, and to get back to your point about carbon, um, I would agree and I would point out too that curbing fossil fuels is one thing, we also need to be able to provide alternatives. And so investing in public transportation is huge, right? We have cities that are not built to, you, you cannot live in a city without a car in most places in the country, right? And so it's one thing to regulate the, the fossil fuel companies, it's another thing to provide people with the means to reduce their own carbon usage. Mm -hmm. There's one, one more question, yes. There is a way to um, get involved and make your points known, and that is on December 6th, there will be a school strike. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they're calling it, but we will be out in the streets on d December 6th, and I'll be sending out more information to the social justice list um, shortly. Okay, so you're not a whole lot of fun at dinner parties. I get it, Kate. Um, <laughs> you, you guys, you and your colleagues are dealing with this stuff daily, and it's got to be a bummer. How do you guys sustain yourself? That's my question. You and your colleagues, how do you guys sustain yourself? This is a really excellent question, and it's one that I, I sometimes avoid because the answer is maybe not very flattering. Um, <laughs> working on this stuff as a scientist is incredible exciting, right? And so being able to work on something like a climate change project is incredibly personally rewarding for me. Uh, and so yes, it is very doom and gloom, but also the more doom and gloom it is, the more likely I get a job afterwards. <laughs> uh, so frankly, it's that. Um, but but <laughs> jokes aside, it does really help to be able to communicate with this, this with people, right? Um, it is very doom and gloom, but also I think there's a lot of reward and a lot of value in sharing the doom and gloom and inflicting it on others. It really dilutes it a little bit. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I don't think we have to end on. Jim needs to set up the room for a, 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 a 12 o'clock event. Uh, Kate, just one question. What was your favorite piece of music that you performed at this church? <laughs> I think it was a Carnival de Venice or something like that. And being able to, I had been working on that song for maybe four years, on and off. And so being able to share it with, with church was really special. So do you miss the yeah. flute? So I do. do you miss the flute? Thanks, yeah. <laughs>